Hello, this is Michael Tracy. And this video is going to look at the effect of hidden assumptions and how difficult it is to find them. And for this, I'm going to take a look at the recent videos on YouTube about the axiom of choice. Now, this seems an odd topic for a channel that primarily focuses on Mount Everest, but the current popularized debate around the axiom of choice has rather important analogies in real life. Namely, the way the axiom of choice is presented by numerous popular YouTube channels is that all the experts agree that it creates these paradoxes or mysteries in mathematics. The presentations usually go on to say that the axiom of choice is both obviously true and yet obviously false at the same time. And this somehow creates this great mystery as it underlies what these same experts claim is all of modern mathematics. As with so many things, the truth is more interesting than fiction. Now, unlike the quantum computing video I did, this video is not going to debunk any of the YouTube presentations on the axiom of choice. I will be referencing popular videos by Veritasium and PBS Infinite Series on the subject, and if you are not familiar with the issues around the axiom of choice, I recommend you watch those videos. Both those videos accurately reflect the popularized version of the so-called debate around the axiom of choice. The rest of this video assumes that you are familiar with the axiom of choice and the arguments made in those videos, none of which are wrong, but which do not present the complete picture. This video will explain what is really going on and why I feel it is important for people to understand this. In his video, Veritasium covers the Banach-Tarski paradox in which a sphere is cut into five different pieces and reassembled into two identical spheres. This process can be repeated as much as you want, creating an unlimited number of spheres out of thin air. For this paradox, the culprit is identified as the axiom of choice. As without this axiom, it is not possible to construct the sets needed to split the sphere into five pieces. But the issue is not with the axiom of choice itself, but with the other axioms that allow the creation of uncomputable numbers. An uncomputable number is a number for which no method of computing all of its digits exist. Now, in this video, I will be sticking to numbers between 0 and 1, so when I'm referring to numbers like pi and e, it will just be referring to the decimal portion of those numbers so that they are between 0 and 1. Now, between 0 and 1, there are an infinite number of uncomputable numbers. In fact, there are far more uncomputable numbers than there are computable numbers. The paradox created by uncomputable numbers can best be understood by asking some omnipotent being to create a number so large that no one can compute it, then asking that same being to then compute the number. At a very basic level, that is what gives rise to the Banach-Tarski paradox. Also for clarity, uncomputable numbers cannot be integers because of various rules of construction, but if you put a decimal point in it somewhere, it can be uncomputable. Every interval on the real number line has an infinite number of uncomputable numbers. That is, just between 0 and 1, there are an infinite number of uncomputable numbers that are so complex that they could encode all the information in the known universe and also the information in an infinite number of alternate universes. You cannot express these numbers nor provide any method to determine all of their digits, which makes them very different from numbers like pi and e, which while infinite in length and non-repeating, can be computed. That is, any specific digit of pi can be determined, although obviously you can't compute every single digit of pi. So the problem is not that we are dealing with infinitely long numbers, is that there are infinitely long numbers for which no method can possibly exist to compute an infinite number of their digits. In contrast, computable numbers include all the integers, the rational numbers, and irrational numbers for which an arbitrary selected digit can be computed, such as the square root of 2, pi, e, gamma, etc. Typically, these have nice Greek letters assigned to them, but there are actually a countably infinite number of them. Uncomputable numbers expressed in the language of set theory come from the axiom of infinity and the axiom of power sets. They have nothing to do with the axiom of choice. For this video, I will use one popular group of uncomputable numbers known as Chaitin's constants, which are designated as omega underscore, some letter representing the Turing machine being encoded, which in this video will be omega underscore u. A Chaitin's constant encodes the probability that a particular Turing machine halts. When dealing with uncomputable numbers, you start to see where mathematicians sound more like religious zealots than advocates for rational thought. The following is from a 1979 edition of Scientific American. Omega embodies an enormous amount of wisdom in a very small space. Inasmuch as the first few thousand digits which could be written on a small piece of paper contain the answers to more mathematical questions than could be written down in the entire universe. Throughout history, mystics and philosophers have sought a compact key to universal wisdom, 
a finite formula text which, when no one understood, would provide the answers to every question. The use of the Bible, the Koran, and the I Ching for divination, and the tradition of the secret books of Hermes Trismegistus and the medieval Jewish cabal exemplify this belief or hope. Such sources of universal wisdom are traditionally protected from casual use by being hard to find, hard to understand when found, and dangerous to use, tending to answer more questions and deeper ones than the searcher wishes to ask. The esoteric book is, like God, simple yet undescribable. It is omniscient and transforms all who know it. Omega is in many senses a Kabbalistic number. It can be known of, but not known, through human reason. To know it in detail, one would have to accept its uncomputable digit sequence on faith, like words of the sacred text. These so-called Kabbalistic numbers are not created by the axiom of choice, and all the problems they create exist in the underlying system of the basic axioms of set theory. Where the underlying issues manifest themselves is when the axiom of choice gives you the ability to select an infinite number of uncomputable numbers from an infinite collection of sets containing these uncomputable numbers. In the Banach-Tarski paradox, the axiom of choice is exposing an underlying paradox from the other axioms. This is why the axiom of choice itself seems to be perfectly valid, but when applied, yields paradoxical results. The paradox was not created by the axiom of choice. It was always there as a hidden assumption of the underlying system. What type of paradox you get depends on the underlying problem with the uncomputable numbers which is being exposed. This leads to the popular phrase that the axiom of choice is obviously true, the well-ordering principle obviously false, and who can tell about Zorn's lemma, even though all three of those are equivalent. And if you work through exactly what the axiom of choice is doing, it will be obvious that each of those are just restatements for postulating a choice function for unidentifiable set members. You can see the fundamental problem in the PBS Infinite Series video when she is constructing the Vitali sets, a simpler to understand concept than the Banach-Tarski paradox. The unmeasurable set mystery is presented as a paradox arriving as soon as the axiom of choice is invoked to construct the final set. But let's break down the construction and see that intuitively things were problematic well prior to the application of the axiom of choice. To start, she breaks up the line segment between 0 and 1 into an infinite number of disjoint sets that collectively contain all the numbers between 0 and 1. These are called equivalence classes, and each one is the set of all numbers that differ from each other by any rational number. She explains this very well in the video, and I am assuming that you have watched that. This construction means that, for instance, the uncomputable number, Titan's omega u, is in one of those sets as are all the other numbers that differ from it by a rational number. Now, you might wonder which set that might be, or more importantly, how would you determine which other numbers to put in the set, as this is essentially saying, make a decimal number so complex that no one can compute it, and then compute whether all these other numbers differ from it by a rational value. Now, I am not the first person to realize this rather obvious problem with uncomputable numbers. There are entire bodies of mathematics that attempt to deal with the issue, including computable math, constructionist math, and intuitionist math, all of which have their own set of problems. In addition, there are numerous different versions of the axiom of choice, which allow different amounts of choice to address various problems while still keeping uncomputable numbers in the system. But what I want to look at here is the presentation used in the PBS Infinite Series video. The problem with uncomputable numbers isn't apparent until she applies the axiom of choice. But if she had said what she was actually doing in constructing the sets, it would be far more obvious there was going to be some problem down the road. Her presentation avoids this by presenting computable numbers that you are well familiar with. She first presents the rational numbers, and then the computable irrational numbers, and here she uses square root of 2 over 2. Those numbers work very well, and if we restricted ourselves to such numbers, there would never be this supposed mystery. Instead, she ignores these uncomputables and makes it seem like the creation of these sets is a perfectly intuitively valid thing to do. And it is not like the uncomputable sets are some small minority of the sets. The number of uncomputable sets is infinitely larger than the rational and computably irrational representative sets that she identifies. Had she instead said, there are all these buckets over here which contain numbers whose decimal expansion is not only infinite and does not repeat, but is so complex and random that it is impossible to even say how all the digits might even be determined. Oh, and by the way, all the other numbers that differ from that number by a rational amount, which we also have no way of computing, well, all those numbers are also in that same set. 
When presented in that manner, you might rightly question whether these foundations are really that solid. Instead, the common examples like square root of 2 over 2 and square root of 2 over 3, it seems that these sets are intuitive and that you shouldn't really ask too many questions about them. And then we are told that when the axiom of choice is applied, that is when the problems come up. What these basic analyses of the axiom of choice ignore are the hidden assumptions that went into the system. Instead, they focus on the choice function and are essentially blaming the messenger. If you had a collection of bags of apples, which you could not see inside, and you then reached inside each bag and pulled out a single apple, if it turned out that all the apples you picked were rotten, you would probably not blame your method of choosing the apples. You would probably be able to deduce that perhaps a large portion of the apples in the bags were rotten. It's not clear why such logic is missing when it comes to the axiom of choice. Another issue with hidden assumptions is that it again highlights that you need to look at what people do rather than what they say to determine their own hidden assumptions. And on this point, the axiom of choice again provides a useful look into a much larger problem. Despite numerous mathematicians rejecting the axiom of choice, analysis of what those mathematicians actually did rather than what they said reveals a different story. The use of the axiom of choice is sometimes hidden, and even if obvious to the expert, may elude the novice. Even several of those mathematicians who rejected the axiom of choice used it unconsciously. Hardy pointed out that Borel, though strongly objecting to the use of the axiom of choice for uncountable indexing sets, used it for indexing a set of cardinality 2 to the LF0 in his proof that there exist continuous functions from the reals to the reals, which cannot be represented as double series of polynomials. Soprinsky demonstrated that Lebesgue, another outspoken critic of the axiom of choice, used it to show that countable unions of measurable sets of reals are again measurable. And Moore exhibited a plethora of examples demonstrating that, quote, future critics of the axiom of choice were freely employing sequences of arbitrary choices in real analysis before Zermelo's proof appeared. So why is this so important? Today, there is much discussion about choices and their consequences, and the frequent analysis is to blame the choice. And this makes sense, as certainly there are such things as poor choices. But there is also the possibility that the choice simply exposed problems in the underlying system that existed for decades and were ignored, overlooked, or even exploited by people who were well aware of how the system actually works. And if you look at what people do, rather than what they say, you will frequently find that the ones complaining the loudest about supposed problems in the system are the ones that have been subtly exploiting those same problems for years.